Whenever we define a new object in mathematics, a very natural question is whether we can classify such objects up to isomorphism. In a previous video, we defined what surfaces are, and our goal now will be to classify those that are path-connected and compact. The statement that we want to prove reads as follows. Compact and path-connected surfaces are classified by two invariants, which are the genus and the orientability. The genus is a numerical invariant that you're probably already familiar with. It basically corresponds to the number of holes that the surface has. Orientability will be discussed later in the video. What is very nice about this result is that these invariants are simple enough that it is possible to list out all the surfaces that are path connected and compact, as we will see. You are already familiar with one of the ingredients that we need for the proof namely Rado's theorem. The theorem tells us that each topological surface admits a unique triangulation up to combinatorial isomorphism. For this reason, we can rephrase our goal result by saying we want to classify up to homeomorphism all the compact, path-connected, triangulated surfaces. The advantage of the triangulated setting is that it will allow us to argue in a combinatorial manner. The next step in the proof consists of passing from triangulations to other more convenient combinatorial descriptions. The description we're interested in, you may be already familiar with, is what we call a planar representation. Much like a simplicial complex, a planar representation is a cell complex whose attaching maps are particularly simple. Namely, it has a single face that we depict as a polygon, and each edge in the one skeleton is depicted using a color. Namely, as we go around the boundary of the polygon, we will see that the edges are colored, and this tells us which edge they are identified with in the one skeleton. Later in the video, we will also see that the colors tell us how to identify the different vertices with one another. In the example, we see an octagon, so it has eight sides, and these are identified in a pairwise manner using four colors. That is, the resulting surface has four edges. We will also see that all the vertices are identified with one another, which is why they are all colored in green, but this is in fact not something that we needed to put there as data, but it will follow from the colors of the edges. What you should remember for now is that the reason why we work with planar representations is because they are planar, meaning that we can draw them and manipulate them easily. You have probably seen already surfaces depicted as planar representations. A typical one depicts the torus as a square with opposite sides identified. This is the description that you get when you see the torus as a quotient of the plane. We can also describe the sphere as a quote-unquote polygon with two sides, which are identified with one another. This gives you a cell structure of the sphere in which the vertices are the poles and the edge in green is a meridian. If we now identify the edges in the opposite direction, this will force the two vertices to be the same, and this will produce the typical planar representation of the projective plane. On the right, you can see how this cell structure can be lifted to the two-sphere, which is the universal cover of the projective plane. Hopefully you remember the genus G surface, the surface that has G holes, and here we are depicting its standard planar representation. It has one vertex, meaning that all the vertices of the polygon are identified with one another, and it uses 2G edges, meaning that the 4G sides of the polygon are colored in pairs. The 2G colors are divided in G groups of two, and the edges of each group appear forming a commutator, as shown in the animation. You should imagine this as G times the planar representation of the torus. And indeed, that is exactly what happens because the genus G surface is the connected sum of G copies of the torus. You may also be familiar with the genus G non-orientable surface, NG, but if not, you can take this picture as the definition. It has G edges and the two copies of each edge appear consecutively and with the same orientation. A first remark that makes planar representations extremely useful is the fact that the fundamental group of the surface is extremely easy to compute by applying van Kampen to the planar representation. 
the generators of the fundamental group will be given by the edges, that is the colors that we are using to index the sides of the polygon, and the unique relation is the concatenation of edges that we obtain by walking along the boundary of the polygon. At this point, you may be wondering whether the surfaces we've shown are in fact triangulated surfaces. The observation to be made is that any polygon can be subdivided into triangles. As shown in the animation, it is not enough that we produce triangular faces. You should recall that in a triangulation, the faces intersect in a very concrete way, namely they intersect along an edge, a vertex, or none at all. However, this is not a problem because it is always possible to subdivide further both edges and faces in order to produce an actual triangulation. After all these examples, we are now ready to relate triangulations to planar representations further. The proposition to be proven says that every path-connected compact surface admits a planar representation. The idea of the proof is to take a triangulation of the surface and assemble its triangles into a planar representation. The argument begins by picking a random triangle in the triangulation. This is itself a polygon that we call P0. Because we are working with a surface, it must be the case that each of the edges that is incident to P0 is also incident to some other face in the triangulation. As such, we can pick an H E1 incident to P0 and a corresponding new face F1. P0 and F1 can be glued to produce a new polygon P1. We can go on with this process inductively as long as there are faces left. Namely, at each stage we pick an edge that is at the boundary of our current polygon. This edge, since it's at the boundary, it's incident to some other face not contained already in the polygon. Gluing the polygon at stage i with this new face will produce for us a polygon at stage i plus 1. This process goes on and it will happen that some of the faces that we want to add to our polygon touch it in more than one place. When that happens, we glue along a single edge and the others we label with a color and an orientation that tells us how to identify them. Due to compactness, there's finitely many faces, and due to path connectedness, we will reach all of them using this process. It follows that we will produce a planar representation in finitely many steps. Using the proposition, we are now interested in classifying up to homeomorphism all the compact and path connected surfaces described by planar representations. As we did for triangulations, let us observe that the planar representation of a surface is rather special, namely the way in which we identify edges and vertices must produce Euclidean neighborhoods. Arguing as in lemma A from the previous video, we deduce that the sides of the polygon must be identified in pairs. And as we stated before, the colors also tell us how the vertices are identified. The reasoning is quite similar to what we did in lemma B from the previous video, but let us spell it out in an example. Suppose we pick one of the vertices of the polygon that we call P and we color in green, and we ask ourselves which of the other vertices are identified with P. There are two sides incident to P, and we draw them on the right, together with the little corner of the polygon that is incident there. We pick one of the two sides, which we call E1, and we color it in blue. The other blue side is at the bottom, and since the two are identified, it follows that the initial point of the bottom one must also be P. We can then take a neighborhood of this bottom vertex and attach it to the corner we already had. The other side incident to this bottom vertex is colored in black, and it has a copy on the left, which tells us that the vertex at the bottom left is also P. As before, we take a little neighborhood of the vertex and we add it to the model we already have. In this inductive way, we continue adding corners to the local model around P that we are building. Eventually, since there's finitely many edges, we will go back to the original corner we started from. And in the process, we will have assembled a Euclidean neighborhood of P.
An important warning that you should keep in mind is that in this particular example, every vertex ended up being P. Namely, we ran the process and we went through every edge. However, there are examples in which you start at a vertex and the process completes without going through every edge. It then follows that some of the other vertices are not identified with the vertex you started with. The easiest example you could keep in mind is the planar representation of the sphere that we gave before. Our next goal is to understand a bit better how to manipulate planar representations and namely we're going to try to understand how different planar representations of the same surface relate to one another. To this end, let us explain some surgery constructions that produce a new planar representation from a given one. The first one is called cutting and pasting, and it consists of two steps. In the cutting step, we choose one of the diagonals of the polygon and we cut along it, producing two smaller polygons. It's important to keep in mind that this cut is not changing our surface. It's only changing the way in which we represent it. In particular, we remember how we cut because the two copies of the diagonal, they are colored in the same way and they have orientations that tell us how to glue. The cutting step is followed by a pasting step in which we pick some other color and we glue the corresponding edges. This completes the surgery construction and we see that the new planar representation has as many edges as the original one. This is not the case for the next surgery method that we call expansion. The idea is that we can choose one of the vertices in our planar representation and make a cut inwards. The endpoint of this cut will be a new vertex and the line we cut along will be a new color, a new edge. It follows that the new planar representation has two more sides. The last surgery construction is the inverse process, which we call contraction. Namely, if we have a planar representation that has two consecutive sides that have the same color and opposite orientations, then we can glue them together. Using these constructions, we will be able to prove the classification theorem. However, before we do that, let us explain how they relate to the notion of orientability. We will say that a planar representation is orientable if, for each color, its two corresponding edges appear with opposite orientations. In this way, we see that the standard planar representation of the genus G surface is orientable, and in particular, the planar representations of the torus and the sphere are orientable. However, as you may expect, the standard planar representation of NG is not orientable. Indeed, all the edges appear with the same orientation. You may then observe that if a planar representation is non-orientable, then the surface contains an embedded copy of the Mobius band. This is shown in the animation in brown. In fact, one of the usual definitions of non-orientability for surfaces is that they admit an embedding of the Mobius band. I invite you to prove that the two definitions of non-orientability we've given, one in terms of planar representations, the other one in terms of embeddings of the Mobius band, are in fact equivalent to each other. It follows that orientability does not depend on the particular planar representation we use, and therefore applying surgery to a planar representation does not change its orientability. We are now ready to prove the classification theorem. For simplicity, we will focus on the orientable case. Concretely, this says that a path-connected, compact, orientable surface must be homeomorphic to one of the sigma g's. The proof boils down to doing cutting and pasting repeatedly in a well-chosen manner. Each step of the proof works as follows. We first find the color A such that the corresponding edges are closest to each other. There may be several options, but we just choose one of them. 
It can also happen that the edges of the same color that are closest to each other are in fact adjacent. Now, due to orientability, it will follow that they are adjacent and have opposite orientations, which means that we can apply contraction to glue them. In the animation, the closest color is pink, which we call A from now on. There are two components in the complement of the A edges, and we call S the shortest one. This is depicted in orange, red, and yellow. Since the A edges were the closest to each other, it follows that if we pick an edge contained in S, then its copy of the same color is not contained in S. It lives in the other side. We call it B and we depict it in red. In between the A's and the B's, there's probably many edges and they form four connected components. We call them omega-1, omega-2, omega-3, and omega-4. At this point, you may observe that if we glue the two A edges to each other and the two B edges to each other, we will obtain a representation of our surface that is partially glued and it looks like a connected sum of a torus with another surface whose planar representation is given by omega-1, omega-2, omega-3 and omega-4. You may think of the rest of the argument as a combinatorial version of what we just said. All right, so now we're going to perform cutting and pasting. So what we do is we pick the diagonal that connects the endpoints of the two A edges. This diagonal should be chosen so that it bounds the concatenation S. What we do next is we cut along the diagonal, which is shown in light blue, and we glue along the B edges. To complete the argument, we perform cutting and pasting again. In order to cut, we use the diagonal that connects the endpoints of D. In the way we've drawn it, this is not really a diagonal because we are not really depicting a regular polygon, but this is not important for the argument. And lastly, we glue along A. The result looks a lot like what we said earlier. On the one hand, C and D appear forming a commutator, and on the other hand, the four words omega-1, omega-2, omega-3, and omega-4 appear now consecutively. The way to interpret this is that the commutator corresponds to a planar representation of the torus that has been connected summed with a planar representation whose boundary is given by omega-1, omega-2, omega-3, and omega-4. This is precisely the intuition we gave in the beginning. You can now imagine that the proof concludes by applying the induction step, saying that you can replace the word omega-1, omega-2, omega-3, and omega-4 by the standard word of sigma g-1, but it's more simple to just continue the argument repeating the same reasoning, keeping the commutator separate, and arguing only with the word omega-1, omega-2, omega-3, and omega-4. The argument for non-orientable surfaces is similar but more involved, so we leave this to the listener. All right, so this brings us to the end of the video. So let us do one last summary of everything we've said. The main purpose of this video was to understand the following theorem, saying that compact and path-connected surfaces can be classified by the genus and the orientability. A more concrete statement was that if they are orientable, they have to be homeomorphic to some sigma g, and if they are non-orientable, they have to be homeomorphic to one of the ngs. The first step in the proof was to use Rado's theorem to assume that our surfaces are triangulated. This allowed us to use the triangulation to then produce a planar representation of the surface. The proof of the theorem then boiled down to applying surgery repeatedly to this planar representation until we obtain one of the standard ones. Furthermore, having a planar representation of the surface is extremely useful for computation purposes. Namely, both the genus and the orientability can be readily obtained from it. In fact, I would like to finish this video by inviting you to compute the fundamental group of each sigma g and ng by using their standard planar representation. In fact, the way in which we prove that the different sigma g's and ng's are not homeomorphic is by seeing that the fundamental groups are not isomorphic. And with that, we reach the end of the video, so thanks a lot for watching.